What I hope to give you now is an overview of feminism in the context of The Handmaid's Tale. Now it's important to know that there are many different ideas about what feminism is and we should keep this in mind when we're trying to wrestle with these big ideas. And so in this I'll be giving some definitions and a bit of history as well as Atwood's interpretation of feminism. And it's important throughout this to have these terms in mind. The first one, patriarchy, which centers around this notion of male power. And the idea of power itself, which is that power isn't held but exists around a person who control knowledge and have the authority to make claims of truth. Foucault's idea that uh, the power is around this authority, knowledge and truth triumvirate is one that's really useful, I think, for describing how um, discourses are shaped to reinforce uh, power structures. Socialism is this belief that holds that power is maintained through strict class structures. And I guess if there's a really loose definition of feminism, it's this critique uh, or a belief system that holds that power is maintained through gender-based assumptions that privilege men or patriarchy. But I think it's useful to look at feminism in light of uh, some quotes by famous feminists, and beginning with Mary Wollstonecraft, who says that she doesn't wish uh, women to have power over men but over themselves. And that women are taught from infancy that beauty is a woman's scepter. The mind shapes itself to the body and roaming around its guilt cage only seeks to adorn its prison. And so for Mary, uh, Mary Wollstonecraft, beauty itself is a prison uh, that patriarchy, I guess, uses to, um, to subjugate women. But then there's a simpler version, I guess, from Rebecca West, who says that uh, she only knows that people call her a feminist whenever she expressed sentiments that differentiated her from a doormat or a prostitute. But Gloria Steinem is a really significant figure in feminism, particularly from the 60s. Sorry. Um, you'll see in the top left-hand corner she's dressed, dressed in a Playboy bunny suit. That's because she came to prominence after writing an expose of the um, Playboy nightclub in New York where she uh, infiltrated and uh, wrote about the exploitation of women through, uh, through the Playboy nightclub. I guess one of the key ideas from Gloria Steinem is this idea of sisterhood among feminists. And what I like in the second quote here is this idea that um, patriarchal power is reinforced because women are so visible. And she says that sex and race are these um, objects of, of power relations because they're easy and visible differences that have been the primary ways of organizing human beings into superior and inferior groups. The thing I like about this quote is that it doesn't simply point to feminism, but all forms of power relations that have dominated Western thought for the last 500 years. But if we come forward here to Be um, Betty Friedan, we see here the implication that men are as much trapped in this outmoded idea of patriarchy as women are, that they are made to feel unnecessary when there are no bears to kill. But it's Erica Jong's quote that I really like. And she says that women are the unexploited group in history to have been idealized into powerlessness. Uh, this here ties back to Mary Wollstonecraft's idea that this notion of beauty and the perfection of women has been used uh, as a means of keeping women uh, out of the politi political sphere and keeping them from being uh, empowered. An idea that comes here, that's re uh, revealed here with Elizabeth Fox Genovese, is this connection between the personal and the political. It's a, it's a bit of a catch cry in feminist thinking, in particular in second wave feminism, that the personal is political. That a lot of our personal relationships aren't in fact part of, aren't in fact nat uh, natural. They're not hegemonic, I guess, is that they're socially constructed. But Margaret Atwood's idea of feminism um, makes it a lot, I guess, simpler. Is that she says that if you believe uh, women are human beings, uh, does feminist mean large, unpleasant woman who will shout at you or someone who believes women are human beings? To me, it's the latter, so I sign up. Her view of feminism is just being about reinforcing the innate equality of humanity among men and women. Seems to me uh, quite sensible. Now, in the 1970s and 80s, there was a, a significant backlash. And one of the significant names in this was Pat Robertson. In 1988, Pat Robertson, in fact, uh, ran for the Republican nomination for president. Now, he's a, what, what's known as a, an evangelical. So for people in Australia, for students in Australia, that might not sound familiar. But in America, there are many um, pr 
prominent uh, Christians who have a television audience and have a lot of sway in the political sphere. In fact, Pat Robertson had a lot to do with George W. Bush being elected in 2000. And these two quotes here point to, um, I would say, quite an aggressive antipathy to feminism, especially when we see this idea that the feminist agenda is a socialist anti-family political movement that encourages women to leave their husbands, kill their children, practice witchcraft, destroy capitalism and become lesbians. And then in the second one here, we have this traditional idea that if you get married, you have to accept the headship of a man. Now, the backlash against feminism has centered around entirely this idea that it erodes traditional family values. For the Christian right, uh, movements such as the Women's Liberation Movement or recent moves to uh, legalize gay marriage have been seen as part of this uh, uh, wave of social disintegration. And feminism in many ways has been scapegoated by the Christian right for issues that are far uh, more complex than that. But now let's look at some of the trends and turning points in how feminism has evolved over the last 200 years. We begin with the first wave of feminism, which goes from around uh, the mid-1800s, perhaps even earlier, to about 1920. And the high point of this is the suffragette movement. The suffragette movement was uh, about voting rights for women. And it's this pure focus on political rights. The second wave kicks in around the 1960s, and we have big names such as Gloria Steinem, Jermaine Greer, Betty Friedan, and they move, belong, move beyond political rights to equality at home, as well as at work and in education. We also see in the second wave of feminism this idea of women's liberation, which is also pointing to how women are, um, are treated in the media. The third wave of feminism, which began in the 1980s, became critical of the second for its lack of attention to the differences among women, particularly cultural differences. Uh, many critics of second wave feminism suggested that it spoke only to middle class white women and didn't speak to working class women or women of different ethnic backgrounds. One of the key um, sticking points in third wave and partly in second wave feminism is what's called the Equal Rights Amendment in America. Now, this is a proposed amendment to the Constitution which would enshrine women's equality in the American Constitution. Now, on the surface, that sounds quite reasonable. It's, a, it's this constitutional guarantee of equality. But for some feminists, the Equal Rights Amendment suggests that without it, women don't have equal rights, that it's not inalienable, it's not a natural right to equality. And so to even think about in, uh, creating a law to guarantee this equality seems to them quite absurd. Now, moving on, let's look at some, uh, some moments in terms of uh, key events and key texts that have shaped how we, how we think about gender and that have influenced the feminist movement. This first one, Married Love by Marie Stopes, is a sex manual that, published, uh, that was published in 1928, and Marie Stopes pioneered family planning. Now, this was a revolution against Victorian ideas of sexuality, which were very prudish and, and saw... Um, and I guess can be summed up with Marie, uh, Queen Victoria's uh, advice to her daughters to close their eyes and think of England. But Marie Stokes wanted to bring a scientific approach to the study of sexuality to get rid of these lascivious uh, gloating and prurient curiosity, as we can see from the quote at the bottom of the screen. World War II was, perhaps, was one of the most significant um, moments to influence um, how women view their political and social rights. Because when, with the outbreak of World War II, as most of the male population went off to fight the war, women were, were required to leave the home and enter factories to aid America's war effort. This was true in America and England and Australia as well and many other countries. But following World War II, with all the male workforce re uh, returning, women were forced back into the home um, to make way for men in the workplace. But despite this, female participation in work has increased. Now, following World War II, we had what was known as the baby boomer period. And we saw an enormous growth in family wealth, a lot more home ownership, and a lot more natural increases in education for women. And that created, in the 60s, this uh, growing uh, segment of young, the young female population who were educated 
and weren't satisfied with what the world was offering them and wanted more. And around the same time, we have the evolution of the contraceptive pill. Now, the first contraceptive pill became popular in the 1960s, and it reinforced the ability of women to make choices about their own sexuality. They could adopt attitudes to sex akin to those of men. It meant that their choices of leaving school didn't mean that they had to just uh, simply get find a husband and get married. They could stay single for much longer if they wanted to, get an education and build a career without having to give anything away. And so this, uh, so this development radically changed how women uh, saw their own possibilities. Now this word possibilities, I'd just like to sit on for a moment because a lot of the time when uh, p uh, young people write about feminism, they, th they talk about it in terms of acceptance or permission. But more so, it's about having a language of possibility. So from the 1960s, women saw more possibilities ahead of them and wanted to take those possibilities. Before that, it could be argued that young women just didn't have those same possibilities ahead of them. Now, Roe versus Wade, 1973, um, you might not have heard of it in Australia, but in America, this still polarizes the political landscape. And it was a legal case that made abortion legal under the 14th Amendment, which covered uh, abortion as a right un under the terms of a right to privacy. The case legally empowered women over their own bodies as a matter of privacy. Even uh, Supreme Court justices are divided on this today. Um, whenever a Supreme Court justice is being vetted to join the course and going through the, uh, the process of hearings, um, they always get asked on this question of Roe versus Wade. Now, in, the 19, uh, in 1991, Sandra Day O'Connor was appointed as the first woman on the Supreme Court. This was a huge moment because it made the notion that America might one day elect a woman as president all the more plausible. And so since then, we've had Madeleine Albright as Secretary of uh, State as well as Condoleezza Rice. Uh, we now have Hillary Clinton as Secretary of State in America. And Hillary Clinton is conceivably um, going to become president perhaps in 2016. Her uh, bid to get the Democratic nomination was only, uh, was only thwarted by Barack Obama. So how does feminism sit with Handmaid's Tale? Well, it's actually not as easy as it might seem. It would resist ideological hardlines. And Handmaid's Tale is certainly a feminist novel insofar as it creates a dystopian vision of a patriarchal caste system. But Atwood is, uh, isn't simplistic in this novel. She, just, she doesn't push a single ideological barrow. She points to the schisms within feminism. That is, there are many different feminist positions that are odds with each other. And Atwood critiques this by giving us a dystopia in which women are a key part in their sister's subjugation. And so it's a mistake when looking at Handmaid's Tale to look at it simplistically as purely a feminist novel. It's a novel that actually critiques the many feminist positions as well, but still points to this basic idea that women are, uh, that points to the idea of uh, women's humanity. And going back to that earlier quote where she just says that, to, uh, that she uh, is all in for a view, of, um, a view of feminism that just holds that women are fundamentally equal to men. And so that concludes uh, the discussion on this video. I encourage you to go and uh, look at the topics that have been covered in a little bit more detail. Again, this is a sweeping broad overview in such a short amount of time of a complex subject, but hopefully it gives you a bit of a, a starting point for thinking about how the feminist uh, context influences how you read The Handmaid's Tale.